you guys are a special class. And the reason I say that is because this morning at 8 o'clock in the morning, I looked outside and it was just keen down, right? I was just like coming way down, right? And I thought, oh, okay, how can we have a lab this afternoon? Be outside, enjoy the fresh air, do some deep physics. And uh, so we actually made a contingency plan to, to bail on the lab. Uh, so we had it all set up that we were going to ask you to uh, either switch to um, to the Friday or kind of somehow join on Wednesday. And we thought, well, we'll just we'll just hold still because if the collective power of the class is so strong that they really want to do this lab, then it'll be sunny. And there it is. It's sunny. So we're going to do the lab. Oh, come on, you guys. <laughs> all right, there we go. Um, so I want to do a couple of things today. The last time at the end of the day, we had this exercise where we had buried some magnets and uh, you'd gone around and uh, you had found some of them. I want to re talk. I want to revisit that. I would also like to talk about uh, remnant magnetization. And I also want to talk to you about um, total field magnetometers and total field anomalies. Those are all things that have relevance to this afternoon's lab, so we we'll want to uh, see where sir, we can go with that. So uh, here we are, we're in magnetics. Uh, we've got energy source in, we've got magnetic susceptibility, and we've got uh, data coming out. And the thing that we didn't talk about uh, yesterday, because we just kind of ran out a little bit of time, are the magnetometers. Um, I don't know why I can't get this guy working. Okay. Uh, there's a number of magnetometers. Uh, we're going to talk about a few of them. The, the one that you're going to use in the beach this afternoon is a proton precession magnetometer. So the, uh, the sensor is up at the, at the head. I'll tell you a little bit more about how that actually works later on. But basically, it's going to be on a pole that is uh, sort of one, just about two meters high and it measures the total magnetic field. So whenever we're in a situation where we've got the Earth's field coming in like this, and we've got an object here that is magnetized, and it gives its own magnetic field, which we call VA, then the magnetic field that we measure is the sum of those is V naught plus VA. And the total magnetic field that's, that's measured is the absolute value of that vector. So that's a, a vector sum. So that's just now going to be a scalar. That's what most of these instruments are, are measuring. These guys here, they're just all measuring the total magnetic field. And you can see that uh, they can be you know, down... You know, you can put them kind of on the ground. You can have them up. Uh, this guy here is, uh, there's one here and one here. So you can measure the total field at two locations and then find out how much it's changing as a function of height. So that's where the term gradiometer comes in because it's measuring the, the gradient. Uh, you can put these uh, into space. There's been uh, a number of uh, magnetometers that are in space. And in fact, uh, there's some three component magnetometers that were built by a guy named Barry Nayrod, who was in the geophysics department. Uh, he probably builds the best magnetometers uh, in the world. And uh, he, a lot of those guys are flying in various satellites in, in space. You can put them in an array on the back of, uh, of an aircraft. This one's actually uh, for a UXO uh, survey. They're trying to do a whole bunch of these and, and fly low. 
Uh, you can have them in various parts like this on this. Here we've got two on wingtips, so it's looking at the change in the field as you go from one side to the other, so that's another gradient array. Uh, sometimes you can carry them just on a boom, so here's the helicopter. You're trying to get this magnetometer away from all of the metal in here. Remember when you did the um, exercise at, uh, in, in the lab? They asked you to take away all your keys and stuff like that because that all affects the fields. So you're trying to get those guys uh, away from that. And the one that you used in your phone uh, are three component flux gate magnetometers. So there's three of these little sensors and they're put uh, just in, well, different phones have them in di different places, but they're often sort of up in this, this top button corner. So that's your, um, your, your magnetic field sensors. We used this one when we uh, did, did the uh, survey in class uh, yesterday. So what I'd asked you to do was to uh, see what you could uh, find with these. And people took the magnetometers out. And I just want to talk a bit about the results. So most people saw the little magnets. Uh, so they weren't very big. They kind of had a diameter of maybe about six millimeters. Uh, that was the largest one. And it's kind of interesting to take that little magnet, which is forgot to bring them, which had a particular scale that's associated with it, just got a couple of millimeters, and scale that up to something that's a little bit bigger. So the thing that I was going to scale to was an unexploded ordinance, which is, you know, these guys are around, you know, the big ones are sort of like 20 centimeters in diameter, and they're sort of that, that, that long. Uh, the table that we used to use, these are a little bit smaller, uh, was one meter by three meters. So it's, it's a little bit more this size, this size of the, of the table. And now you can imagine this little magnet kind of sitting on, on this table, and then you're trying to find it. And so you're going over it with a, uh, this little magnetometer. Uh, so the question is, if we were going to scale uh, this experiment with our little magnet to the size of, of the table, uh, there's about a factor of 33 that's, that's different. So this third uh, survey area goes, which would have been you know, one meter by uh, three meters, now goes to be about uh, 10 by 30. So if we did a, a, an area that is the size of this just outside what used to be the, the front lawn or outside of the ESB building, you end up with something that looks kind of about that area. And now you're trying to find a UXO that's you know, 20 centimeters. And that is exactly the same scale as if you had taken one of those little magnets and just put it someplace, any place on this table. So I think that kind of gives you an idea of you know, of what it might be, be like, because that, that guy was, was pretty small and this table is pretty big. So if you're trying to sample, it would be uh, a, pretty, a pretty big challenge. The, yeah, so the, the size of that UXO is about the size of one of these dots here. And, uh, you know, you can, you can see that that's pretty challenging. Another one that uh, can perhaps resonate is if you, uh, for those of you who are in sort of mineral exploration and you wanted to say, okay, let's find a, uh, a copper deposit that's worth a billion dollars. So that would be a significant achievement for an afternoon if you could find something like that. And if you took the scale of that little magnet and you tried to up it to uh, trying to find a copper deposit, that was a billion dollars, uh, then you kind of have to go through this scenario. Again, we're going to use the table size as a, uh, as a scale. The magnet's going to be uh, six millimeters in diameter, a couple of millimeters uh, thickness. And so it's got a volume of about 10 to the minus eight cubic meters. So if we want to find uh, you know, a billion dollar deposit, then we need to 
have a, a certain volume. And when you start off with the price, so at the time this slide was written, it was around 310 US dollars per pound or 684 per kilogram. So if we have a need for a billion dollars, then you know, decides, OK, how many kilograms of this do you need? So you can try to figure that out, OK? Divide 1 billion by 684, that would give you something. And then the density of, uh, actually, maybe I'll just, I used to have people do this as an exercise, but I don't think we need to do that. So that would, in order to do the uh, billion dollars, you need about a million kilograms to, uh, uh, to, to really make it worthwhile. And then you've got to figure out, what, okay, what's the density of copper? So it's just about 9,000 kilograms per, per cubic meter. And that means we're going to need a certain volume of this. So we need about 163 cubic meters of copper. And then it's not going to be pure copper. So typical value of a reasonable copper normally may be you know, like 0.3% or something like that. So that means that you get, you need about 54,000 cubic meters of this. Sounds like a big number, but actually it's not. It's only like 38 meters on a side. So yeah, I guess not. This is probably close to, what's this, 25 meters across? 20 meters? Anyway, something a little bit bigger than this room and, and the volume. And that would be the size that, that you'd need. So the, the scale length ratio is about a factor of, of 10,000. So if we scaled up the, you know, the size of the, <laughs> of the table, uh, it would now come to about 10 kilometers by 30 kilometers. So if you're going to put that in perspective, so here's, here's, here's the idea with uh, the mineral deposit. So we've got this area. So this is about 10 by 30 kilometers. So you're going from where we are here over beyond Surrey and 10 kilometers this way. And now we've got an object that's 38 meters cubed sitting someplace here and is a dot on any of in, any of these areas is in here. So the, the the point I wanted to make about that and that should have come back with respect to uh, what you did in the uh, example here is that if, if you were going to try to find something like that, and you thought, OK, well, I'm just going to drill and try to hit that by kind of direct sampling. Your chances are really, really small. On the other hand, if you can find some way of uh, measuring a particular datum that has got sort of a broad signature that's, that's attached to it, and then you can sample that datum easily, then you get information out about where that thing was uh, relatively easily. So I think with this, if you think about it, and then also this afternoon, what we're going to do is uh, give you the opportunity to try to find something, that first instrument that I showed you, that proton precession uh, magnetometer. And you also can have the opportunity to try to uh, dig it by hand, if you like. So. Uh, see what your success or not is of that. Uh, let's see. Come back here. OK, so any, any questions about that? The whole purpose of that was twofold. One is to illustrate the basics of magnetics. The other is to illustrate the, uh, you know, the potential advantages of having some kind of remote sensing as opposed to just going ahead and, uh, and, and growing. So I'd, I'd like then to return to the, uh, to the use of the app. How many people were able to download the applet, and how many people had a chance to work with it? 
It, who, who actually downloaded the applet? OK. Uh, I encourage everybody to uh, get, give this a shot. So maybe I guess the thing I want to do now is we'll, we'll, we'll kind of go through a couple of things that we did just at the end of last day just to kind of highlight things. But I don't want to spend a lot of time just kind of working through particular examples. The, uh, the informative thing for you will come when you actually try to work with the applet and try to see what the responses are. So again, our... Our goal here is uh, the following. So we're going to bury something at some point on, on the Earth. And for now, I'm just going to bury something right at the North Pole so that the magnetic field is coming in. And then if I come over here and I put my object down here, so here's my... So this is the Earth's field. Now we just kind of want to be a little bit local and so I've got something that's magnetized down like this so here's my anomalous field that's coming in here and at the surface I'm going to try to look at this anomalous field and see okay how is it going to be represented and I have because it's a field I've got three component, so I can have an X component, a Y component, and a Z component. So it means I need a coordinate system, X hat, Y hat, and Z hat. And then how did we decide if we got a number here, for instance, if I'm sitting right here, and if I'm looking at that anomalous field, it's, it's coming down. And then how did we decide if we were going to plot that positive or negative? Anybody? Positive if it's going in the positive direction of the, I guess in this case, the z-axis is pointing out. Perfect. So when the field component is pointing in the direction of these axes, then we say it's positive. If it's pointing in the opposite direction, it's it, it's negative. So if we look on this particular ex example here, where the magnetic field is coming down, then all of this field that's up in here is going to be positive or negative. negative. Yeah, it's all going to be going to be negative. So if I looked at it, at what that the profile would be, so I've got something that's really negative, and then as we uh, come out. <coughs> Uh, as, as we come out over here, it's going to kind of come back to, to, to zero and then actually maybe a little bit positive. And it, so it's going to be something then that basically looks like this. And if I, so that's a profile across here. If I plot it in plan view, so if I look down on it, then I'm going to see something that, that looks like this. So my... Let me just tune that up a bit. You notice how it's kind of like a little bit lumpy here? It's a little bit lumpy because we, uh, we're we looking at the um, digitizing what the full signal is with respect to these number of points. So that's the number of points, and we've got 20 here from this section to this section. So that's actually not very many. You can kind of see the discretized uh, effects there. If I come back and increase that to, let's say, 50. Oops, I didn't want to actually do that. So if I, if I increase it to 50, you can see how much smoother it's, it's going to be. And now if you look to see what the character of this field is, you see that it's it's negative over here, so here's our, here's our signal, it's completely negative, and then it goes back to zero, we're just a little bit positive. Let me explain the positive part. 
So when it's coming down like this, it's clearly in this direction. And, and you might say, well, wait a minute, what about up over here? I go a long ways over here. Well, yeah, the magnetic field is coming, <coughs> it's coming up, so it should be positive. Okay. But we don't seem to we, we don't seem to see very much positive effect. So why why is that? Anybody? Yeah? Uh, well, is it measuring the vector sum of the Earth's magnetic field too, so the magnetic field pushing it down? No, we're just plotting the anomalous field. Right. So this is actually something that we haven't explicitly talked about um, for for this. But the if I have a if I have a little magnet here, okay, then if I'm sitting right up close to the magnet, the field's pretty strong. But the farther I go away from this magnet, the weak the field becomes. And if I go a long ways away, uh, it actually goes almost to zero. And does anybody know if I have a, if I have a, uh, a magnet, how the magnetic field falls off with distance from the magnet? Yeah, so the magnetic field has one over R Anybody? Cubed. So you remember from uh, the very first year of, uh, of physics, if you remember that far back, yeah, you had, uh, you, you looked at gravity, okay? So you had a little mass particle. So you had a little mass particle, and then the gravitational field, okay, was G M fell off as gm over r squared. So the, the magnetic field, or the gravitational field, falls off as 1 over r squared. And that was effectively just due to a, you know, a single element of, uh, of, of mass, which is kind of like a pole. In magnetism, a plus pole and a, and a minus pole, and the effect of that is that the magnetic field falls off as 1 over r cubed. We'll come back to this a uh, little bit later. I'll actually write an expression for, for this, for what a magnetic dipole looks like. But the point that we haven't yet factored into this, so we, we factored in like how the, you know, uh, what the directions are of these fields, but we haven't factored in this business of, of the magnitude. So, the farther that you go away from here, the magnitude is going to fall off as 1 over r cubed. So even though the magnetic field vectors are coming up like this, the, the amplitude of that becomes very small. The result of that is that this profile across here has got something that's just a little bit positive, and then it's really affected only by what is going on here and the negative. So this is something that you also have to remember for this afternoon, because one of the stations that you're going to do is we're going to set something up, and you're going to have to think about, okay, where this thing is being placed effectively in the Earth's field, so that the magnetic field of the Earth is coming in at a particular direction. And then you're actually going to, you know, take a stick in the sand and kind of sketch out what this profile is, is going to be, just to kind of help you kind of figure out what the, what the pieces are. Our experience, actually, from past years, is that was one of the most instructive things that people had done. That came back and said, "Oh yeah, it really kind of helped me solidify." Okay, so what we've got, we've got. Something that's magnetized. We've got the anomalous fields, and 
that you know, as we sketch them, that tells you what the uh, what the geometry is, and then as you're trying to figure out, okay, what's really going to be big and small, then you have to factor in the fact that, okay, as I go farther <coughs> away from here, things are just going to get smaller. And also on this case here, if we had the same magnetization, but we look at a different at a different field. So for instance, if we looked, that was the Z component of the field, if we looked at the X component of the field, now of course we get something that's really quite different, right? Because over here, the X component is, is pointing this way, over here the X component is pointing this way, so that means there must be a zero crossing in place. On this side it's pointing in the negative X direction, so that means it's negative. And on this side, it's in the positive x direction, so it's positive. So the the profile now must must look like that. If we look at it in 2D, uh, if we look at it in in 2D, we see that we've got something that looks like like this. So this is negative over here. This is positive over here, and here's what the profile is. You take the same object, put it in the ground, measure different components, see a different signature, see a different profile. The, uh, another thing that's, uh, that I wanted to stress here, which again will play a role in, in the lab, We've got, uh, you have to figure out where your sensor is with respect to the object that you're, that you're looking at. So the object is, is here, so it's buried at a certain distance beneath the, uh, uh, beneath the surface of the Earth. And that distance is given by this quantity here, the depth. So at this point, the object is sitting right at the surface of the, of the Earth, but the sensor is this, so this is the receiver height. So very often we use Rx for receiver and the height, and it's 1.2 meters. So basically the object is sitting right at the table level and you're measuring up about like this, and the characteristic signature that you have looks like this. We're going to be doing something that there's an important aspect of this curve that's, that's really useful, and that's something called the half width of the curve. And by that we mean here's the maximum value of, of, these, of the signal, and that's at you know, minus 45 units. So if we went down to minus 22, that would be the, 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 you know, the half value. And now we look at the full width of, of that. And we find that that is given by about yeah, a meter and a half or some, something like this. So in this particular case, we've got the object that is sitting 1.2 meters below the, uh, below the sensor. And the half width of this guy is sort of of that order. What do you think is going to happen if I put this object down if I, if I bury the object. What might happen, just kind of thinking about this guy. Can you guys see the blackboard? Okay, so if I'm, if I'm sitting here, it versus here, two, one, one, two. If I'm looking at, at, at these, at the signature, should be, what, what, what would you expect might happen? The deeper one's going to be weaker, good. Remember that was a, that one over R cubed thing, right? That's going to be good. Uh, 
So the half width will get thinner as it goes deeper. Anybody else? What else might we see? Okay, so let's try that. So let us take this, and instead of at zero depth, we'll make it deeper. So we're just going to take the, we're going to take the same object, nothing else changing, and we're going to make him deeper. So we'll put him down to two and a half meters. And then, oh, what happened? I have to run this? There we go. Oh, how do you do that? Okay, that's not fair. Just a sec. I see. Okay, so that was one of those uh, things that's supposed to be an immediate aha moment I get, and then I screwed it up for you. Okay, it's okay. It's it's not going to be the first time. It'll be it'll happen again. <laughs> okay, so uh, where are we back here at one point two, and. Oh, and we want B, Z. Okay. Oh, and we were at, uh, I think we were also at five meters, if I remember, six meters, right? So that's the X limb, X max. Okay, so we're back exactly to where we were before, except the number of points, right? Okay. So do I actually have to make something change? Okay, there we go. Okay, here we are. Uh, so we've got this thing buried right at the surface. We've got the same number of points. Here's our curve. Okay, and now we come back to making it deeper. So let's make it two meters deep. And then get this. So there's two things that have happened. One is that the whole thing has been spread out. And the other, which I didn't draw attention to, well, actually we did, uh, was the amplitude. If, does anybody remember what the amplitude was here before we just did that? Pardon? Yeah, so it was about minus 45, okay? And now it's down to minus, you know, 1.6, okay? And the other thing is that this signature here now has not gone, has not contracted, but he's actually gone the other way. And the reason, you know, to understand that is that as we as we go deeper, you know, we're now our, our magnetic field, you know, field lines are still attached to this guy, so that. We really only are seeing these, you know, these big field lines. So nothing much <coughs> is it is changing uh, very readily as as we go through here. But there's a couple of really important things. So first of all, if we look at this half width here, okay. So now this was at 1.6. So if we now go to 0.8, okay, half width here goes from four to about eight. So that's like four meters. So if we look at this curve, it's four meters half width. Well, is the is the object? So right now the object is sitting. What depth? Somebody tell me. 
This is 2.6. And where's the receiver? One, yeah, so 1.2. So that's 3.8. So the receiver is 3.8 meters above the above the target. Okay. That is above the depth of burial. So how cool is that? Okay, so we, 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 we come along, we've got something buried, we get this field, we get a signature over top of it, and now we, we know where it's buried, right? It's going to be buried right underneath the maximum. That's good. So now we know where to dig. Question is, how far do we need to dig? Well, we can actually use the characteristics of this of this curve. We look at the half width of this curve and we say, ah, oh, that's four meters. We're probably going to have to dig you know, four meters down to, to find this guy. So with this with with, the, with this image, we not only find a character of something that we're looking for, we can localize it horizontally, usually fairly easy if it's just a simple simple body. But the other thing is that by looking at some aspect of the curve itself, you can get some information about the depth. So if we kind of go back here, again, you, you can see how the character uh, changes. Now, as we come back up, in this particular case, we're 1.1, so that should be how, how far are we from the receiver now? Depth is at 1. Yeah, about 2.3. Right, so we think, okay, 2.3 meters. If everything is going uh, according to rule, then the half width should be, you know, sort of around 2, a little over 2 meters. And if we look at this, so this is now at 6.5, so it's 3.2, so here's the half width, and uh, that's 4, that's 8, so that's about 2 meters. So the rule holds. Okay. The other thing is if we to get a, get a whole bunch of things, right? So the, the, the deeper that you bury something, the broader the... Uh, the the signature of it is going to be. And secondly, the uh, the width of the curve will, will vary. Let's test out this other business of the uh, you know, the one over R cubed. So how 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 can we test how can we test this guy out? Okay. What would you do? Oh, somebody says, oh, you know, fields should fall off as 1 over R cube. And you've got it now. How would you prove that, disprove it, satisfy yourself that it's reasonable, not reasonable? You could doubt it. You look at what the magnitude is, the measure magnitude uh, between two different distances of um, separation. And then see if the, the difference in measure magnitude is the cube of the distance. Perfect. Perfect. Gold star. <laughs> what was your year is I was sure your name was? Andres. Sorry, Andres? Yeah. yeah. We'll we'll mark them up here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so let's do it. So let, easiest number is one. So let's make the receiver height be one and let's make the gap be zero. Okay. So now if we look at at this, then the the maximum value is about fifty five. Okay. And that's for depth equal to one. 
uh, one. And so now let's go to two. And then what's the number we should get up? So what, what, what are you saying? Who says cube root? Oh, come on. You guys are so quiet. Goodness. Okay, what? Okay, what, sh what should we get? Perfect. Yeah, so we're changing r by a factor of 2. Things go as r cubed. That means a factor of 8. So if I take 55 and divide it by 8, I get... Oops. 6.9, whatever. Okay, so let's see. Okay, experimental error. This is about 9. Did we do something wrong? So at two it came out to be nine. Let's 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 do another one. Let's do three. So we we were expecting about seven, we got nine. Okay, if we do three, then we should have what? Anybody? Yeah, so now we should be about 27. And and we get uh yeah, close to close to 3. So what's going on here? I mean, we're, we're kind of close, right? Sort of within, you know, 10 Ten percent or something like that. So it's not that, but why are we exactly? Why are we exactly parking? Should be. We were we're we're really close, right? I mean, we're within you know ten percent or something like that. So that's that's not bad, but we're not exactly there. Any reasons? A double gold star for anybody who gets this, because this is actually this is this is the one. Yes. Sweet. Okay, your name is Matt. Matt. Okay. Good. Yes. This this one of our cube was for a point, like a point dipole, but actually, remember our object was it's it's actually kind of significant. It's a half meter by half meter by half meter. And especially as you're putting it, you know, close up, uh, this thing no longer really acts like a point. And the numbers that are coming out of there are exact for what this kind of prism is. Okay, so that's what's happening. Uh, oh dear. Okay, I need to tell, tell you one more thing. This magnetometer that you're going to go and use today. Okay, is a total field magnetometer. It's, uh, and it, as I said, it measures the magnitude of the field, which is equal to the magnitude of the Earth's field plus the magnitude of the anomalous field. Okay, you are going to do, what you're going to do is to generate a total field anomaly. The Earth's field is big, right? It's sort of like fifty thousand nanoteslas. The object that you're going to be dealing with, you know, they're, they're small guys, right? You know, have uh, amplitudes of maybe, you know, 100 nanoteslas or, or, or something like this. So this guy is small. So the amplitude of this guy is much less than the amplitude of the other scale. In order to work with 
you know, just the anomalous Earth's field, or anomalous field of, of the object, what we're going to do is generate a magnetic field anomaly. In this app here, it's actually listed as TF, total field. You could say, you could list it like that. TF, total field, is the measured amplitude of the field minus the amplitude of the Earth's field. So that is going to be a number that, uh, that, that, that you measure. And then it's a question of, okay, how do we in interpret that number? Because, like, it, suppose we have the Earth's field this way. So let's just suppose here is B0. And now, so this is like 50,000 nanoteslas. And now we've got, at any particular point, we've got the anomalous field of, of, the, of the target coming in. So here's VA. You know, I, I mean, sometimes it points one way, sometimes it points another way. It's kind of all over the map. And so if we think about another uh, vector here, which is the anomalous field. So at some particular particular point, we've got a little bit of anomalous field that, that's coming up in the direction. What the, what the magnetometer measures is actually the length of this guy. Right, so this is, this is B naught, that's B A, that's B naught plus B A, and it's going to measure the length of it. If we look at this length, and we say, oh, well, I'd like to subtract this this amount from from here, then what do we have? If, if it's effectively so, imagine this. Imagine this vector here, and we just kind of you know swing it around on, on this on this arc. So this is everything here. Everything on this is the magnitude b naught plus b a. If I subtract from this here, then I've got a vector that is of length this, right? So this is the delta B that I'm going to measure, or but the question is, how do I think about it? And what you see here is that this, you know, this vector here that's coming here is pretty much the same as if I just took that anomalous field and just kind of projected it onto this x-axis or onto the axis of the Earth's field. So that means that this difference here is approximately equal to the direction of the Earth's field and the projection of this anomalous field onto that. So the other way, it's the anomalous field projected on dot product, remember, right? B naught half. So B naught half, we talked about, that's the unit vector for the magnetic field. B A is, is it. So that, that is the total field anomaly that you're, you're going to get. So you're going to take the proton precession magnetometer, you're going to go to a base station, measure the total field, right? And you're going to come over the anomaly, you're going to measure this total field. You're going to subtract those two numbers, you're going to get some number out, right? 37. And then how do I think about that number? Well, you're going to think about that number as being the projection of the true anomalous field onto a particular direction. And that direction is the Earth's field. So why this is going to be easy for you is because you spent all the weekend working with the app, thinking about taking these anomalous fields, projecting them onto X, Y, and Z. Now you're going to do exactly the same thing except Instead of projecting them onto X, Y, and Z, you're just going to project them onto another vector that's that's some that's some direction. So if we if we're sitting up here, so let's do the example that we were working with. Uh, we've got magnetic field that's coming in. So here's 
coming in like this, okay? And so it gets magnetized in this direction. And now we've got a magnetic field that's coming in like this. And now we're going to measure the, so here's the anomalous field, and we're going to measure the total field anomaly. So that is actually then going to be equal to the same as one of these previous components. So B naught is aligning up with the vertical component here. So when we when we do this, we're actually going to get we're going to take the projection of this anomalous field onto that particular direction, and then that is going to be uh, our, our so if we look at this example, and if we think about projecting it onto this direction here, now what do what's going to be you know the magnetic fields coming in like this, you know, field. So what is going to be the value that I have uh, as far as my B of T? My total field is great. Is going to be positive or negative? So my my total field is going to be B A dot B naught hat, right? And now I'm going to to plot this thing with the same kind of conventions that we always. If the anomalous field is in the direction of the uh, of this in the Earth's field, because here now my unit vector I'm thinking about is this guy going down, uh, then he's, I'm going to get this number out here and he's going to be positive. So now my magnetic field anomaly for the total field is actually going to be something then that looks looks like this. Um, so if I plot this guy here, so I get something that looks just like the, the, what the Z field used to be, but, but now my, because my sign convention is that I'm looking for, I'm going to plot positive anything that is projected onto uh, the Earth field, then I've got a positive value. So what the procedure will be in the SAN is as follows. You'll be asked to put an object someplace, you know, kind of thinking about it being someplace on, on the Earth, and the magnetic field lines are going to come in like that, so things are going to get magnetized in a particular direction. Then you can think about the Earth's, the anomalous fields coming in like this, and now at any particular point as you come, come across here, you're going to think about these field lines and what the projection of that is on the Earth's field. And if it plots in the same direction, you're going to put a positive number. If it plots in a different direction, you're going to plot a negative number. And then you're going to think about everything as falling off as you know, 1 over R cubed. And that will actually give you then the signature of that. So you'll give that a shot. And then It'll, it'll start to kind of make, make some sense. And then if you come back and if you play with the app, and we'll pick this up again on Wednesday. And uh, yeah, by Friday, you'll, I've got all this. Okay, so the plan is for those people.